welcome his presence into this place from the first service on. Let's just welcome him here. Hallelujah. Lord, you're welcome here. You're welcome to do whatever you want to do, Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs>
such a powerful way. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Wow. If this is how we're starting off, I don't know what all God has for us here, but I can tell you what God is gonna be pouring into us today, tonight, and tomorrow. Amen, believing in that, believing in that. <laughs> Welcome to She Can Ladies Conference. It is so glad to be together again, to be with you ladies. And for the power of God that we already have and filling in this place, because I believe she can, if you'll listen to me, she can praise, she can worship, she can dance, she can shout, she can have victory, and we're believing that here today because of God before us. Ha. God's already in the midst here. He's already at work here. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, you may be seated. I believe she can pray and she can believe. She can trust God in impossible situations. At this time, I'm gonna have Shalani Field, Sister Shalani Field, she's gonna come up and she's gonna share a testimony and then she's gonna lead us into prayer. Because I believe God is gonna be outpouring into us. But before God can pour into us, we need to empty ourselves out of the things that we brought in. And so Sister Shalani Fields, if you'll come up here, and I just believe she's gonna lead us, and she's got such a wonderful testimony. She's gonna speak to our hearts here. Sister Shalani Fields. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord praise. Thank the honor. Thank the Lord. It's an honor to be standing here before you, Sister Carter. Thank you. All the staff here, I say praise the Lord and I love and appreciate each and every last one of you. God is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. I give him the glory, the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, Revelations 12 and 11 says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Today, I want to share my testimony with you in believing and hoping that you will overcome in Jesus name. Before I met God, I was someone who had, I had no idea of who I was or who I was supposed to be. I had no real identity. I was a very lost individual with no direction. I was far from a believer. I did not grow up in church. I knew nothing about church lingo or culture or background. And all I knew, hallelujah, was what was going on around me, my environment, which was drugs and, and, and abuse and dysfunction all around me. And at a very young age, my mother decided to put me in basketball. And basketball was my life. It was my covering. It was that thing that kept me from the streets. It was that thing that kept me out of the gangs or was supposed to. Oh, but because of my environment, even though I, I still played basketball, after all of the, the basketball games and after all of the practices, my home life and my home environment it was quite the contrary of, of, of discipline and structure. My mom, hallelujah, was a single mother. She did the best that she could, could to take care of us. Oh, but she was a single mother raising seven kids by herself. And I told you, I, I was a basketball player and I was a star. I was inside uh, the magazines and on television and I played in the Rose Garden and basketball was truly taking me places. People believed that I was going to be the one to make it. 
For many years, I was in homosexuality. I was in a relationship, and I thought I was going to marry this woman. I even wore an engagement ring on my finger. Sometimes I would dress feminine, and sometimes I would dress masculine. And there were, there were days where we would have such an abusive relationship, and it was so toxic that we would stay up trying to pop pills and cut ourselves to commit suicide. It was an abusive relationship. There was one time that we got to fighting and got to arguing that she took a heel and she threw it at my face and blood began to gush down my face. This was in high school from my junior year all the way to my senior year. And now it was time to go to college. I had offers, but because she did not, I decided to stay. And I decided to go to a community college in our city. And not long after that, after I gave up my dreams, after I gave up everything for this relationship, I found out that she was soon cheating on me multiple times. And it got to the point to where it totally tarnished the relationship. And this, this breakup left me at the lowest point of my life. I stopped eating. Fear overtook me because I felt like I had no identity apart from her. And the drugs that I was selling, I started to use. Addiction started to take over my life. And how everything began to unfold for me. There was one night I was out with a friend and we were partying all night and there was a drug that he had given me and I was already intoxicated off of uh, alcohol and I'm telling you I took this drug and I remembered nothing after I took the drug and that morning we woke up. It was about seven in the morning and his car it had no top. It had no hood. We found ourselves waking up uncovered, no clothes on. And it was at that moment where I knew I had gone too far and I needed help. Oh, God. I talked with a friend and she began to tell me that she was moving back to Indianapolis and, and, uh, because her grandmother had passed away and, and that was, she was scheduled or they said that she was going to, um, she was going to pass away. So they came back here, uh, to, to finalize things. And so I said, can I go with you? I need to go with you. I had no clue who I was moving out here with saints of God. But once I got to Indianapolis again, I wasn't a believer and I started to do pretty good at this time. I was doing okay. And I was uh, not drinking as much, but uh, after a while I started getting into the nightlife and there was one night uh, I was so drunk and I was so high. I came back to the house and I fell through the door and I, and I begin to crawl up the steps and I was so sick and tired of being sick and tired that I laid out on my bed and I cried out I said if God if you are real the way that people say that you are then show me show me that you are real God and I'm telling you a warm hand came and touched my back and it sat there for eight to ten seconds and everything that was in me began to sober up and that's when I became a believer and I'm telling you God didn't stop there oh God is a mighty God I stand here today because the power of God I stand here today married for almost 13 years to an amazing husband four children free saved delivered and set free by the power of the Holy Ghost if it had not been for the Lord today if you are here and you need a touch from the Lord if you got addiction if you're battling fear anxiety I want you to raise your hand right there come on God's getting ready to deliver in this place God's getting ready to sweep through this place the power of God is here the anointing is destroying the yoke right now come on sisters Look beside you.
you. If there's somebody with their hands up, go and pray for them right now. Come on, link up, pray for your sister right now. Yeah, that's it, sister. Get your deliverance. Come on, breakthrough. Breakthrough is here. Come on, I want you to pray for the person next to you right now. Yes! She came here hungry. She came here thirsty. God is filling her up right now. Come on, all around this room, find somebody to pray with right now. Come on, sisters, I know it's the first day, but God is not here to play. God is here to set somebody free. God is here to move. Come on, in the name of Jesus. Come on, if you got an addiction right now, God is going to heal. God is going to deliver. Come on, I feel it. I know you feel it. Come on, if you have faith as of a grain of a mustard seed. Oh, that's it. Come on, pray and intercede. Oh, maybe you're okay. Oh, why don't you intercede for somebody right now? Where are the intercessors? Where are the prayer warriors? Where are the weepers? Come on, that's it. That's it. Press through. I feel a press in this place. Press through. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I speak deliverance. All right now. All of a mental health. Mental illness right now. Every mind battle. Everything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. It's got to come down right now. In the name of Jesus. Come on, tell fear goodbye, no more. You can't control my life. I will not sit in this box. I will not be paralyzed. I will not close my mouth. Come on, freedom is in this place. Shayana Mosiah. Come on, this is the sound of victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Somebody need to lay hands on themselves, on their mind, and say the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. Oh, in the name of Jesus. Come on, that's it. Come on, that's it. Do you believe? Come on. I know there are people in this place right now who have been praying for prodigals. You got a lost loved one that has walked away from the Lord. I'm telling you, I'm the only one in my family right now who is saved. But I'm telling you, God is doing a work. We just baptized my mama in Jesus' name. He's able, he's able. Do you believe that? Our God is able. Come on, press in. Pray for that family member. Pray for that son. Pray for that daughter. Pray for that cousin. Pray for that nephew. Come on. Come on, press in, press in. Do you believe? We can walk out of here and they'll call you and say, take me to the water. Take me to the prayer room. I need to pray back, back through. I'm ready to live for the Lord. Come on in Indianapolis. God is saving prostitutes. God is saving dancers. God is saving drug addicts. What if I told you a prostitute is one of our greatest soul winners right now? Right now, we'll go out to outreach and she'll be the only one coming back with a soul to be 
be baptized in Jesus' name. Come on. I'm just, oh, God. We were in a service one night and my husband was ministering and we had no clue what was going on in this church. And we just seen this woman I ended up praying for her, and that was it. Later that night at 12 o'clock in the morning, that's all right. Get your deliverance, sister. Ah, uh, the deliverer is here. Say, this is my exodus today. This is my exodus. I'm coming out. I'm coming out. We gonna have a coming out Holy Ghost party. Oh, I'm coming out. She said, I wasn't gonna come to the service, but the kids wanted to come to Children's Church. And a long story short, story short, she said, I was getting ready to commit suicide tonight. I have the plans in place, but I heard the word of God. And I'm telling you, she's alive and well today. Just one touch. Anybody here like the woman with the issue of blood? She pressed. She brought her way, and she just said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be made whole. Anybody like blind Bartimaeus? Anybody hungry for deliverance? Anybody thirsty for deliverance? It's here, it's here today. all over this place, why don't you give the Lord a mighty shout of praise for His delivering power. He is the deliverer. He is the way maker. He is the provider. He is the healer. He is everything you need. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. In the scripture, you will find over and over again where God's people were told to fear not and to trust in the Lord. Even King David wrote a song, an of unmatched trust in a sovereign God. When he pens Psalms 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In fact, one of Jesus' most common commands to his believers was to fear not. But it's hard to not fear when storms are raging. It's hard to have peace when you can't find calm in life. It's hard to trust God when you are rendered powerless by disease. But I have come this morning to remind somebody today that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. He's that kind of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The tsunami storm of my life came suddenly and unexpectedly in May of 2020. While many details still remain a blur to me, there are certain words that still echo in my mind. You have breast cancer, triple negative, grade three, stage two, unpredictable, aggressive. The doctor told my husband and I, aggressive cancer requires aggressive chemo and you will lose your hair. Words cannot adequately describe 
exactly how overwhelmed we were by that news. Just weeks after receiving the diagnosis, I had a port placed and began aggressive chemotherapy. Doses one through four went, well, as well as chemo can go. But dose five put me in the hospital very near to the point of death. After 16 rounds of chemo, I finally finished intravenous chemo on November the 24th of 2020. Bald, no eyebrows, no eyelashes, 30 pounds swollen from steroids, and physically and emotionally weak. In January of 2021, I had my first lumpectomy and then a second one in February so that they could get clean margins. Radiation was next on the list and I took 30 rounds ending in May. As soon as radiation was over, they put me on oral chemo for six months as they referred to cleanup measures. Finally, on October the 1st, 2021, our oldest son Gentry's birth date, my oncologist declared me in remission, or as I like to say, cancer free. Thank you, Jesus. While all of that information may seem very cut and dry to you, I can promise you that that process has not been simple and it has not been easy. In fact, throughout the process, issues would arise that would cause my doctors to fear that the cancer had, metastas had metastasized, even recently. I began noticing major changes in my tissue and I was sent back through the whole gamut of tests and Everything came back clean, but then in February, even more changes raised more concerns and another battery of tests were done. And finally, my doctors looked at me and they said, Annette, your tissue just cannot be trusted and you need to move forward. So last Tuesday on April 12th, I had a bilateral mastectomy with immediate reconstruction due to an immense amount of radiation damage and also for preventative measures. And I am happy to stand before you and report that just a couple of days ago, my surgeon called with a pathology report and my body remains cancer free. And I praise God for it. I thank him for it. You've been so good, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. At the very beginning of this journey, when my husband and I sat alone trying to process what we had been told, my husband said to me with confidence, I just don't feel overwhelming fear in my spirit. I believe that the Lord has this. Telling your family something of this magnitude, especially when you have three sons, is a daunting task because we are conditioned as mothers to protect our families from hurt and to shield them from life circumstances. But one by one, we talk to each of our boys and our three beautiful daughter in loves that the Lord has blessed us with. Our first call was to Gentry and Destiny, who were at the time holding a revival in Dallas, Texas. After the initial shock wore off, Gentry said, Mom, I am so sorry that you are having to face this, but I just don't feel any fear about this. God's got it. A conversation was then held with Dylan and with Kayla. And once the news had time to sink in, Dylan simply looked up from the sofa and said, there is nothing to fear, says the Lord. We then called Spencer and Caitlin, 
And his response was no surprise. I'm so sorry, Mom, but I don't feel any fear about this. And I knew of a surety that God was speaking through my family directly to me that I had nothing to fear. It's hard to not fear when storms are raging. I have walked through rain and I have shuddered as thunder rolled and as lightning has struck across the sky. But a tsunami hits completely different because it overpowers you. I had never truly trusted God until my body was being crashed by the waves of disease. Being raised in the church, I had been in his presence in powerful ways, but those times pale in comparison to his presence in the darkness of my storm. One such experience happened in August of 2020 while I laid in a hospital bed here in Indianapolis. I was awaiting tests because the doctors were certain that the cancer had metastasized to my liver. And due to COVID restrictions, my husband was not allowed to stay with me that night. So I was left alone to my own thoughts and my own emotions. I laid in the bed that night and I prayed, God, if you have ever let me know that you know exactly where I am at, I need to know tonight. I fell into a deep sleep, which was unusual because of the amounts of steroids that I was on. But at midnight, I woke up to the sound of voices in my room. Of course, I thought the nurses had come in to take my vitals, and I turned to look and realized that there was nobody in the room. Very alert, I sat up and I began to listen to the multitude of voices men's voices, women's voices. But the only voice among them that I could recognize was the voice of my husband. All night long, I'd fall asleep and wake up and they had continued to pray until about six o'clock in the morning when the door opened and my husband come walking in that room looking exhausted. And he sat down in the chair and he said, I haven't slept me and Jesus have been talking all night long. I said, yes, sir, because I heard you. Phone calls, text messages, direct messages started pouring in from people all around the U.S. and even from other countries. I don't know what was going on last night, but the Lord woke me up and I have interceded for you all throughout the night. And to no surprise, when that doctor walked in, there was no cancer in the liver because God had heard the prayer of intercessors on my behalf. Thank you, Lord. When we shared the news of my diagnosis with our congregation in Frankfurt, I made this statement, I will never ask God why, but I will ask him who. Who is it that you intend for me to reach through this process? And I am standing here today telling you that I am so certain that the Lord spoke to me about this very moment that I know that one of you are sitting in this congregation today. You may have come to ladies' conference in dire need of a miracle, but I have come to tell you, your miracle has met you here. It was already here. It was waiting for you to show up. This is a God-ordained moment. 
you may be in the fight of your life and feel like that you are going under for the last time, but I am here to tell you that it is the dawning of a new day and you will not leave here the same way that you came. God is going to do the miraculous in your life. You may have already gotten the diagnosis and the doctors are telling you that it does not look good. But I want to remind somebody in this place that the doctor does not have the final say. My God has the final say. It may be bleak, but even now God can bring hope. It may look dark, but even now God can cause the sun to shine again. It may look like life is over, but I know the one who speaks life into every situation. I've come to remind you that you might as well go ahead and throw your hands up in victory and praise him for the promises. He is meeting you here. He is going to heal. He will restore. Throw your hands up all over this place. In the name of Jesus, let healing flow. Let healing virtue flow. Strengthen everybody in this place, God. You are our victory.
speak victory. Somebody just call on the name of Jesus. Come on, there's healing in that name. There's deliverance in that name. There is freedom in that name. And there is victory in that name. Victory in the name of Jesus. 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 Victory in the name.
awakening that's happening in this place right now. There has been such an increase of faith that has been built up all across here. Right where you're at, if you'll lift your hands unto Jesus, We've got people who are praying here at the front and say, God, it is in your hands. As Sister Jordan was saying, God, my miracle is here. My miracle is here right now. Your miracle, your miracle is here. Somebody just call out the name of Jesus. Somebody just say, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, We believe there is victory. We have victory, Lord, in your name, Jesus. Every stronghold will be broken. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, we praise you, Lord. One more time, let's just sing that one more time as we lift our hands all across here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is moving. We thank him for what he is doing right now. If you would like to make your way back to your seats, we know he has a word for us today. Hallelujah. 
You're a good God. You're a miracle worker in Jesus' name. The young ladies who are going to be attending Sister Hannah Peterson's class, you can make your way up to the room above the port above the portico. My right, your left, it's for all single ladies ages 16 to 25-ish. You can make your way up there right now. I know she's got a word for you. And then due to expected large attendance tonight, we're asking all of the licensed minister's wives if you would please join us on the platform and sit in the choir loft. That would really help us out with seating so that we can have everyone get a chance to sit in a seat. The lady you are about to hear from is no stranger to Indiana. In fact, she received the Holy Ghost right here in Indianapolis at the Bible Church when she was nine years old. Yep, she's a Hoosier. I had the pleasure of hearing her first back in 1994 when she came to the Bible Church to do a, a ladies retreat there. Young, 22, minister's wife, didn't have a clue what I was doing. But she made a huge impression on me that year. She connects with audience like none other person. She can have you crying tears of laughter and weeping with conviction the next minute. No one connects with an audience quite like she does. And I know you're going to be blessed to hear her ministry today. Let's give her a hand, Sister Donna Linville. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Isn't he great? Hallelujah. He's so wonderful. Wow. Oh, my goodness. I feel like I'm just the cherry on top of the cake. This was tremendous. And this was tremendous. All the, the testimonies, the music was tremendous. And it's just tremendous, tremendous, all of tremendous. Sister Carter, thank you for the honor to be with you in this wonderful committee and to be with my dear friend, Shara McKee. And oh my goodness, I just feel like I'm in the middle of a party. I, I'm all for parties, popcorn, M&Ms, and Diet Coke. The Diet Coke sort of balances out the M&Ms. You know what I'm saying? Now that's my psychology. It, it, I wrote that book. And then to have my sweet Lori Bennett with me. I don't know where she's at. She's here somewhere, but she's from our church. Uh, she flew with me to be with me to help me sell my DVDs back there. And those are humorous DVDs. So if you want to laugh, go home and take those with you. But it is a joy to be with us. And oh, I've already been blessed by the spirit that's here, by the testimony of his word and by the testimonies. And all the above has just been great. So, and then I'm thrilled to be with you. Don't you love a big party? Don't you love to be with friends? Oh, yes, I love it. I love it. I get a thin headache when I'm around people I love being with because I'm laughing and wheezing and choking and, and, and then I need a rest because I'm, I've been having so much fun. Uh, my mother, years ago, uh, this is the DNA I came from, she loved chocolate, and we were eating uh, at the dining room table, and she had been given a box of chocolate. She was eating it, choked on it, and started, she was just grabbing her throat where it lodged, and my sister grabbed her and started beating her back, and, and, uh, and the piece of chocolate went across the room and hit the wall. And then there on the ground, she was, because she fell. I mean, it, she couldn't breathe. I mean... <laughs> And so they, my sister was a nurse, so she was able to do it. And, and so, uh, and then when that finally came out, she just started laying, she started wheezing and laughing and hollering. And, and my dad looked at, and we all started laughing. I don't know why we were all laughing. And then mother said, I could just see it in the newspaper, death by chocolate. <laughs> and so, and we were all laughing. My dad said, is there something wrong with this family? I mean, <laughs> 
So I just want to share just a few. Uh, a merry heart doeth good like medicine. We've cried. We, we, tried, we, we Well, we may do it again. But uh, I want uh, just a merry heart doeth good like medicine. I was thinking, Sister Jordan, as you were going through all of that, my heart was blessed at what God's done for you and how great God is and how great God is, how great God is. And so um, I was just thinking of the magnificent of in your testimony. I'm sorry I didn't get your name, but I can't hear anyway. So, <laughs> but that was wonderful. But I was thinking of that hospital moment. And uh, when I was 31, I had cancer and I had to have surgeries, a bunch of surgeries. That's why I never could have children. But uh, I was in that service the night before my uh, surgery that I was having in the morning was uh, the night I knew that I couldn't have children. And I was crying because I knew all of that was going to happen. And I was in a semi-private room. And the woman beside me had oxygen and she was real bad. And so um, I was laying there and a woman came in, a nurse, and she said, you're my last patient of my career and I'm going to give you a blood transfusion. And so I said, well, okay. And in this hospital, uh, they knew me because uh, we pastored that little town. And so I put my arm out, and that nurse had a little tremor in her hand. I was her last patient. That was the last night. And so I don't know if you've ever had a transfusion, but it's like a garden hose needle. That needle is bigger than life. And, it's, and so she was going into my arm and going to I-44, I-95, I-85. And she could not get anywhere in there, you know. And then I had a little chubby on top of all my veins. So she was just trying to go every which way. And I was going, oh, uh, uh, you know, and she's pulling out, trying another interstate. And so finally, I, I wanted to say something, you know, like, oh, you know, oh. And the lady beside me, she, she said, um, you're making me nervous. Get somebody in here that knows how to do it. Get somebody in here now. She said a few choice words I will not say here this morning. And so she went away, and a nurse came in and, and immediately found the interstate that's supposed to have. And uh, so then she left, and I looked at that woman, and I said, thank you. Thank you. I wanted to say all those things, but a few of the words you said, I couldn't say those. But I wanted to so bad, but I was trying to keep a right spirit and everything. And, I, uh, and this, uh, humor... The spirit of uh, humor hit us. We started choking and laughing and wheezing. She reached up and turned her oxygen higher, and she was just, we were, we were hollering and laughing and just having a time. My arm is out, you know, this pump going into my arm, and she can't breathe, and we're just, and then all of a sudden that lifted, and she turned it down. And fell asleep, and then it dawned on me, God's got it all together. You see, God just came in. He did, he did a little infusion with me with humor that made me choke and laugh and wheeze. And, and it's amazing how God comforts us at the strangest places. And you heard voices all night long. And so the Lord helped me reminisce the night that I was choking and wheezing with that, all that blood and all her can't breathe. And, and so it, it was a great night that God had it all together. I wanted to tell, uh, share a funny story. Some may have heard this. This is new. And those that may not know me, uh, it really does happen. I, I wish my life... I wish I could tell you that all my incidences were embellished. I wish, I wish I could tell you that, but that's not true. I mean, they really do happen the way they do happen. But I was flying from uh, Atlanta to Memphis, and the man in front of me had a bald head. That's important that you know that. 
And so, uh, so I lock, I put my seatbelt on. When it dawned on me, my skirt was twisted. And so we were starting up that runway and starting to go up when I thought, well, I'm just going to unbuckle and grab a seat and just stand up real quick and let my skirt drop and sit down. So we're starting down that runway and just starting up. I forgot about all that force, you know. <laughs> and so I stand up, and when I did, I, I stand I grabbed his seat, and when I grabbed his seat, it wasn't locked. <laughs> and I grabbed it, and I pulled him all the way back, and I just slammed my lips right on his head right here. <laughs> and I gave him a big kiss right on his head. And he went, whoa, whoa. And I, I fell back, just. <laughs> I let loose of the chair and just fell back on my seat and fell over the lady beside me. And, I was... <laughs> and then I went, ow, 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 ow. I didn't realize some bald people are a little fuzzy or something. I was, ow. And I was just going, ow, ow. And I finally, the lady beside me, she was beating her leg and hollering. Everybody around was hollering. And, and so finally, when she quit laughing, she said, uh, oh, that's the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I said, honey, if you only knew my life. <laughs> well, the whole little, this is a short flight. I was just like, oh, oh, oh. Oh, it's like nasty. I don't know what this is. I can just feel that, you know. <laughs> so we landed, and so I thought, oh. <laughs> so he we get up. And he he gets in front because he reaches up to get. He carries it just a little bit further. He reaches up and gets his uh, suitcase above his head, and he looked back at me. He went bye, <laughs> and I went bye. <laughs> Everybody just, well, everybody started laughing. I got off the plane. I called Gary, my husband, and I said, Honey, you're not going to believe it, but I kissed a man on his head, a bald-headed man. He said, I believe anything you would tell me. Anything. I was flying into Dallas. There was about four of us. We went to a conference together. And so I had fallen asleep. As we were turning, going around Dallas while we were in pattern to go land, and I just fell asleep right then. And somehow or another, the pilot landed hard. And in my sleep, I just went, you know, like that. Well, when I went like that, I went, we're crashing. Everybody put their head down. We're crashing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name now. Put your heads down. Well, we were just running down the tarmac, you know, going to the gate. <laughs> and I looked around, and I went, eh, eh. and my friends beside me went, Donna, what? <laughs> so people were disembarking and getting off the plane. I, they said, let everybody get off. Don't look at nobody. Don't give them. So my, my demeanor, I was trying to explain there, but well, well, I was asleep, you know, and they were past me by and pat me, and I, well, what it was, I was asleep, and my friend said, they don't know you, don't say nothing, just put your head down there. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to go with me. <laughs> Only Lori, Lori does in our church, she'll travel with me. Today, I want to talk to you about come home. Come home. Um, I don't know about you, but <laughs> I've been lost a lot driving. Uh, years ago, there used to be MapQuest, and I you get you run it off the computer and pieces of paper all on your dashboard, and you're trying to read this page to this page to this page. You remember those prehistoric people? You know what I'm talking about. But I was caught in a situation where uh, we went a missions trip to Scotland, and nobody in the group was over 25. And so all of a sudden, I was handing a van key to drive in Scotland. 
on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> now, on the right side, you know, I, I get really bad on the right side. So, uh, and so they, they, they said, well, I had, people had to be over 25. So I had the van with all of the young men that was under 25. They, they were stoic and quiet the whole time. When we got to the airport, they got on their knees and kissed the ground when we got home. <laughs> But uh, I don't know why they did that. I do not know why they did that. But one moment that remembered that I remember of that week that was a monumental moment for me was we were trying to get to a particular place. And uh, we were in that roundabout maybe 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, I had my window down hollering, where is Loch Ness Monster? Where's Loch Ness? That city that Loch Ness is, that, that canal or wherever. There's a city, I can't remember the name of it. You get there, see if there really is that monster out there, which by the way, it isn't. But anyway, I don't want to spoil your trip to Scotland. But anyway, <laughs> I got in that roundabout and just kept on going. <laughs> I had no clue which you go that road, that road, that road, that road, where it is. You know, I make a terrible God. I can't direct my life. No way. I don't have a clue what tomorrow holds. I don't have a clue what health issues I'm going to be faced with tomorrow. I don't have, I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible God. I, 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 I can't figure out anything past my nose. We were in Papua New Guinea on a missions trip down there, and my husband woke up in the middle of the night. I looked over, and uh, his eyeballs, stuff was coming out of it, and and he said, I can't see. And I went, oh, my God. Oh, we were out in the boonies, boondocks, jungles, no life. <laughs> I panicked, and I, I ran to the bathroom, and I, this little tiny bathroom, we couldn't use the water there. And uh, couldn't be in our eyes or ears or anything. And so I was in the bathroom, and I was going, oh, oh, what? Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're out here by ourselves. I don't know what to do. And, and then the Lord said, uh, what about me? And I went, what? Wait, wait. Oh, yes. Oh, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. What? Oh, God, help us. Help us. Have you ever had moments like that? That panic moment hit you? How desperately we need God in this world, in this life, this cares of life that we face. Life feels like, sometimes life feels like a rag in a dog's mouth. I don't know if you're like that, but have you ever seen a dog shake a rag? Just, just jerks it back and forth. Psalms 127.2 is a verse that we really, really need more than anything in the world to understand the, when I realized that I cannot face my tomorrow without Jesus. Verse Psalms 127, 2 says, It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. I don't know if you realize the commodity of, commodity of sleep, how precious it is to sleep. This verse in a, another translation says, it says, the bread of anxious soul. There was a safari in a, a group of people who went to a safari, and when they were there, uh, they woke up every morning and they were wanting every, come on, come on, we got to get up early. We got to go, go, go. We got to see all these animals. 
and let's get going. And so they were just pushing those guides. And the guide guides finally just said to them, okay, today we're stopping. We must let our souls catch up with our bodies. When I, when I read that statement, I said, that is so true. And today I'm talking about returning to God and let him detox us. Detox us. And only that requires, only that that we go through and, and how we handle things and how we are subject to all of our world that we're in. I don't know about you, but I'm coming off of the reference of my own spirit. I can let this world just poison me, poison me. I can get on this. I'm not a, much of a social uh, media person. It bothers me. But I have been on there and watched dogs scream. I love those. Where those Eskimo spits or whatever those dogs scream. I don't know. I think that's the funniest thing of the world. I love those. But I have sin set mindless. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong in seeing those dogs scream. If it makes you laugh, laugh with them. <laughs> but... In, there's a scripture in the Bible that I want to highlight that um, Isaiah 30, verse 1 through 2. And I have found that the refuge of the Spirit in the coming to Jesus is the only way that you and I are going to sustain ourselves in these last days. When he says, joy unspeakable and full of glory, how is it that we can look? I tell myself when I look in the mirror, I want to have joy. I don't want to have sadness. I want to have peace. I don't want to have anxiety. I, I, I'm trying to figure out how to sustain myself, to go through my life, how to get through it all. And Isaiah 30 one through two, I just wanted to highlight this element here. I'm not saying we're rebellious children, but I just want to read this. Woe to rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. We can go on Facebook and we can go online and start finding counsel in the secular world and in the things of this world and get this blog and this blog of un... I, I, I've read, I read books that maybe people are not full of the Holy Ghost, and I get something from it. But when our spirit starts reaching out to the things of this world and to the things that entertain us in spite and not God, and we, we become full of, of poison and we start getting our opinions shaped by the things of this world, and we're getting our opinions opinions how we raise our kids by ungodly people but oh I tell you what there is a source of the almighty God that he wants to help us raise our children how he wants our marriage to be hallelujah hallelujah Jesus hallelujah hallelujah Jesus we can reach as the Israelites reach to that verse one again, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. Oh, what is wrong with us? Come home. You're going to the wrong source. Come home. Return. Come back. Come to Jesus. Let him take care of your situation. I'm all for resources. I am constantly have friends that send me vitamins. That says, Donna, are you okay? <laughs> well, I don't know, but if you're thinking I'm not, do you have a vitamin for it? I did. Someone told me about a vitamin. I had COVID for the second time, and 
uh, most of my hair is gone. I don't know where it went, but it flew away. But, but I'm for reaching out to certain things, but there's a, there's a tipping point. There's a tipping point where we quit finding the source of God. There's a tipping point that our flesh is starting to go to the things that satisfy the flesh and stay home and watch online instead of coming to church. There's a tipping point if you're laid up with sickness and all, but if you can drive to work, if you can drive to McDonald's, if you can drive to Walmart, you can be in church on Wednesday nights, on Sunday mornings. You're tipping off. You're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. Hallelujah. Come home. Come home. Come home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As that verse says, and take counsel, but not of me. And that cover with co a covering, but not of my spirit. That they may add sin to sin. Oh, what do we cover our emotions with? What do, we, what, what, what do we do to appease? I promise you, I would rather call my best friend on Monday morning than go to prayer. Because if you've ever called your best friend before you pray, it satisfies a certain level of emotion that you get off. You can cry to them. You can tell them your woes and your problem. And you, dis, you sort of deflate the need for God. But, oh, I want to go to God before I come to my friend. I want to go to God before I go on my social media. I want to go to God before I satisfy a covering over my emotion. Hallelujah. When I worked, believe it or not, I worked at e, I was an EMT. I know that's a shock. Because I would cry and pray over everybody that came in there. And they told me the first, second week, stop. Stop crying over everybody. <laughs> but those EMTs are not the EMTs today. But in that era, I was there. And we had a man that came in, and he had a high fever, very sick. And, uh, but there was no outside sign of anything wrong with him. And the doctor was perplexed and trying to figure out what is wrong with him. And finally, he just said, well, you know, I did cut myself, but it's healed. It's healed. And so the doctor said, let me look at it. And the man, the scar had, had developed, and, and he pressed it. And then we realized that that high white blood count and all that. It, and so they had to open that wound up, and it was full of staph. It was, it was not healed. And you know, you can close off. You can close off, but it is still full of staff. It is still full of unforgiveness. It's still full of bitterness. It's still full of, un, un, of anger, of jealousy, of envy, and everybody thinks it's healed. But oh no, you're living with a disease. You need to be healed of jealousy, envy, strife. It's got to, it's open it up. Come home. Let God heal that. Open it up and clean out that toxic chemical and that toxic waste inside of you. People come to church all the time looking like they're healed when underneath they've got so much junk. Oh, oh, live, live. I don't know if you've ever been so sick that when you got well, you didn't realize how sick you were. Oh, and that's how it is. That's how it is. You don't know that you're walking around with bitterness. You don't know that you used to sit on the front row and now you're in the back row. You don't know that the, that, that little something turned your spirit and now you're toxic. But, oh, that's, that's destroying your soul. But it also destroys those around you because there's a spirit. There's a smell to infection. There's a smell to infection. And there is a nasty smell to infection. Yes. Come home. Come to God. Let him do it. Verse 2 says, that walk 
to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves, but to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. I don't know about you, but I can't find my strength in, in this world or in this culture or in this political realm. I'm not going to find my strength in Pharaoh or in Egypt. I can't. I'm, I'm a holy child. I don't belong to this earth. I have been transformed into a child of God. I don't belong to this. I'm an alien. I don't live by the rules and the, of the jurisdiction of this world. But are you teaching your children that? Are you teaching your family that? Have you gone into the cultural world to where Egypt is more prevalent than the kingdom of God? Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. My dad wasn't in church. My mom, as they were saying, Sister Julian, I got the Holy Ghost when I was nine. My mother was 39. My sister was 16. And our world was, it was something else. It was changed so radically. And that night when she came down the aisle, Brother James Simonson and was ministering and she came down the aisle and next thing all three of us were sitting together and uh, she came and next thing we knew she fell out. Well, we all, brother, sister, my sister and I, we ran to mother. I thought she had died. And I started going, ah, she's dying. She's saying something. I don't, what is she saying? I, oh, you know, I thought she had gone into a convulsion or something. I didn't realize that she was just got the Holy Ghost. And so that night when we got home, she set us all three down and she said, when I find out what happened to me tonight, I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> oh, wow. But that point on, my mother never was a dim light. I don't know what she got infused with that night. Well, I know it was Jesus. But until she died at 98, I've got a video on my phone of her speak. We Every night we would sing, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Every night before she go to bed. And then she just started speaking in tongues. And I've got to tell you this. Oh, my word. This means everything in the world to me. The last four months, she was non Communitive and couldn't, and we were changing her diapers and in a hospice bed and moving her. She was just moving her and couldn't talk and everything. So I was, I was changing her diaper and cleaning her and moving her around and the chucks under and everything. And I was crying and just speaking in tongues and crying that I was going to lose her prayer covering. Because she was going to be gone from me. And she had always been my greatest fan and support of prayer. And so I was just crying. And keep in mind, she had not talked. No communication. We were give, she was on morphine. She was, it, it was not a good time. And I dropped her diaper on the floor. And when I did... All of a sudden, I heard, Donna, my prayers are stayed. I jumped up. I said, Mother. She said, I. She looked at me. She opened her eyes with clarity. She looked at me, and she said, my prayers are stayed. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Lori, I think that was her last time she spoke. I can't remember. I think she said some one last thing. She said, one of my nieces, I'm happy. I'm so happy. Oh, hallelujah. I'm telling you, when she said that, I ran to my husband. I said, is that biblical? <laughs> I mean, is that biblical? I, I, I didn't know. <laughs> He said, babe, you know, they collect in the bottle. He went through all this scripture about this and going forward and, and this. And I went, oh, Jesus, 
I don't know about you, but the minute she got the Holy Ghost, even though my dad was drinking, cussing, smoking on the, on the, the, at the living room couch, but I tell you, she got plugged in. And if you're dim, if you're dim, and if you're weak, and you don't have a love and a devotion for God, these children are going to be swept out with the culture of this world. Egypt and Pharaoh will be their God. But oh, I don't want my child. If I had a child, I don't want them to serve the Pharaoh of this world. I don't want them to serve the Egypt of this world. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, you and I need to come back to where we were. Where we were. We need to come back as these, as Isaiah was trying to tell the Egyptian or trying to tell the Israelites, come back, come back. Don't do this. You're reaching out to the things that don't satisfy. You're reaching out and God is waiting on you to take care of you. With the keyboard to sort of come and play and sort of make me think it's almost over. Wherever you are. It's just, I like to hear it. Just, I'm not totally there. Oh, I want... I have, I have reached out to things to satisfy me. Popcorn. I have run through an airport. Wasn't there used to be popcorn in an Indianapolis airport? Where are those? I am heartbroken. I told Lori, I said, they, they sell these specialty popcorns in this airport. They were not there. I am a connoisseur of popcorn. I grew up eating every Saturday night a big bow. Mother would make a big bow of popcorn. And I have ran through an airport to go somewhere that I'm speaking at. And I'm barely making it to the flight. And is that popcorn? Where's that popcorn? <laughs> where, where is it? Okay, I wonder if I could run faster. That's how pathetic I am. But one thing I will, and I want to share this in our final moments to you, with you. Psalms 84, verse 6. I have to constantly remind myself of this scripture. Constantly, constantly. The Bible says this, who Blesses the man whose strength is in thee. Verse, I'm sorry, verse five, please. Bless is a man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them, who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. This Baca is a valley of tears, of weeping. I'm sure you've heard this many times. But the part I wanted to say is this. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before the Lord. So a valley of tears. A valley of tears. A valley of weeping. What are we going to do with our life? What are you going to do when you don't have money to pay utilities? What are you going to do when you go through a situation with your children and an unsaved child and you're going through a health issue? You go through a death. You go through whatever the situation is. The Bible says here, for you to get through the valley, you've got to dig wells. You've got to dig wells as you walk through heartache, as you walk through physical illness. 
You say, well, I don't have strength to do that. When I was going through the situation that I was when I was 31, I was in the living room, and I remember thinking I hadn't prayed like I should. I, was, I just hadn't read my Bible like I should. I'd lost my calendar. I'd learned, I lost my discipline. I was sick. I was hurting. I, I just felt like I'd failed God. I remember that distinct moment, and I said, God, I don't have strength to do anything. And the Lord spoke to me and said, do you have enough strength to lift up your eyes? That's all I want from you. To lift up your eyes, which cometh your help. Your help cometh from the Lord. God is not a taskmaster. God is not someone that says, if you don't pray two hours, you're not a part of me. He's not that type of God. If you think God is someone that's judging you and standing over you and wanting to beat your brains out because you're not this and not that, God, come home. Come home. You don't understand the type of God we're serving. He's a good God. He's a kind God. And oh, just lift up your eyes, which cometh your help. Your help cometh from the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The key to you and I is that we have to build a well. We, we, but so that's just what I did. Why, why would you say lift up your eyes? Well, what, really what, what Jesus was just saying was just acknowledge me. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I need you, Jesus. Help me. Help me. Help me, Jesus. One of the greatest moments in my life is and this moment, we're going to have an altar call. A moment that I cherish more than anything in the world is when we pastored in Tennessee on Christmas Eve, when the services were over and all the, the Christmas plays were done, we pastored there. We would get in the car and we would start going home. It was a seven hour drive, and it was the day before as the prehistoric day of pay phones. And I would call every two hours and say, Mom, I'm almost home. We're lacking four more hours. And I remember I would always call one hour before we would arrive in Tupelo, Mississippi. And I would say, we're an hour away. We'll be there. And all of those people are gone today. Every one of my family members. But when I would drive up, my mother was so, I don't know where I got this drama queen. I don't have a clue. But we would honk our horn. And when we honked our horn, that front door was slam open. My baby! We were in Walmart one time. Mom was like 90. And I heard someone saying, baby! I was on the other aisle. Baby! I came around that aisle. And there was another customer looking at something. And I said, what do you want, Mom? And she said, that other lady says, she's a big baby. <laughs> I said, I am a big baby. I sure am. She would scream, and then here comes everybody, Gigi the dog, my dad, my sister. Everybody would come out of that door welcoming me. Tonight, if you've been going through your life, your marriage situation, and all you've done is lock your jaw and become bitter. You've become meaner or more grouchy. Or you, you've taken it upon yourself to carry the weight of your world. I'm telling you today, there is a well that we can dig that God is saying, I want you to get through this valley. I'm going to help you get through the valley. 
But the source is not Egypt. The source is not Pharaoh. The source is not another covering. But you've got to dig through the well. If you don't, you'll die in the valley. But I don't want to die in the valley because on the other side of the valley is the mountaintop. We're coming up. We're coming out. We're going to make it. It's going to be a better day. God's going to help us. He's going to help us get out of that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. Hallelujah, Jesus. Have you been digging a well? Or have you been reaching out to this world? If you feel no joy, if all you feel is sadness, there is joy unspeakable. There is power in the Spirit. The only way that you and I are going to supersede all of our life, we have to have divine power. Divine power of the Holy Ghost. You, it has to be divine. There is no substance. There is no vitamin I take him. There is no nothing that can overpower your situation, but God Almighty, only God himself can overcome and override all of your life. Only that can happen. You need a divine touch from God, a divine touch to help your mind, to help your soul, to help every part of your body. Hallelujah, these altars are open this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Reach out to the divine. Come home. Come home to Jesus. He's at the front door waiting on you. He loves you. He loves you so much. Hallelujah.
beside you, hallelujah. 